This is Slashers, a podcast about movies and more for those who love horror. Now, Brian, if I was to tell you... Oh, wait. I'll introduce myself, I guess. My name is Jake, and with me, as always, is my esteemed <laughs> colleague, co-host, and cohort, Brian. Say hello to the mutant goons from beyond. What's up, goons? Now, Brian, if I were to describe for you a movie in which two developmentally disabled men are held hostage by a group of doomsday preppers who ultimately starve them, neglect them, and then try to blow them up. What movie would you think I was talking about? I have no idea, man. It sounds scary. Terrifying, right? That's why this (laughs) week we're doing Biodome. Bud and Doyle are here to save the world, but who's going to save the world from Bud and Doyle? (laughs) Also, so good. Your dome away from home. God, yeah, yeah. movies I, just aren't made this well anymore. I'll tell you that. No, they're really not. And uh, honestly, I feel like this is one of the movies where they just kind of close their eyes, took a couple darts, maybe a couple bong hits, and just let it fly. And wherever the fucking darts landed, that's where it's going with it. You know, I honestly have no idea where the like the character story arc is or why they are like they are. Maybe it's just you know the typical. I guess I'm talking shit on JC students, but I'm like the JC dropouts, I guess. Yeah, right. (laughs) But honestly, like the movie is dumb. There's no question about that. But then there are like weird savant moments and like some great references that we'll get into. And there's like a a very interesting subplot to this film that involves true crime. So we can get into that. And then also make sure you stay tuned until the end of the episode where we will pair this film with an actual horror movie. For those of you who don't know, as part of our April Fool's celebrations and also the fact that everybody we know is in quarantine, we are doing some lighthearted films for April. Our Patreon bonus episode for this month is going to be April Fool's Day. So if you want a straight up and up horror film, you can do that. But yeah, we're going to be going through some sillier, wackier movies and we're going to be arguing and advocating as to why they deserve to be called horror films. So Brian, shall I get into the trivia for this movie? Yeah, let's get to it. So did you know this movie holds a whopping one out of 100 on Metacritic, and 4% on Rotten Tomatoes. See, now I feel like that's uh, an accomplishment in itself, right? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's like the best of the worst. Not to take the nomenclature from the Red Letter Media series on YouTube, but that is a testament. And for it to be like anything good is crazy (laughs) to me. I mean, anything else you do literally is, is going up from there, right? (laughs) <laughs> after the fact yeah and actually i'm looking on it here the room you know the tommy why the room from 2003 yeah. has a 25 percent on rotten tomatoes so they are saying that that film is six times better than biodome get the fuck out of here with that. that yeah i don't know once again rotten tomatoes just fails to entice me to believe anything that they have at all yeah they suck they suck butt nuts now, the film did win Polly Shore a Razzie, which he co-won with Tom Arnold in 1996. You'll remember Tom Arnold that year starred in Big Bully, Carpool, and The Stupids. I'm my own grandpa. So I those never three seen movies any of those. were perceived as being as bad as the one Polly Shore film. Wow. Eesh. I don't know what's worse. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it won two out of three nominations at the Stinker's Bad Movie Award, which was worst on-screen hairstyle for Stephen Baldwin and most painfully unfunny comedy. Uh, again, Pauly Shore was nominated for Worst Actor and lost outright at that time to Tom Arnold. Now, shall we get to the statistics for this week? Yeah, buddy. On a budget of $15 million, this movie grossed $13.4 million. Ooh. I don't know. I mean, honestly, though, that I would consider that a success for what it is. You know, what I mean, it's almost the same return compared to some other movies that I feel like that we've seen that are just really bad. You look at the difference between the two and you're like, oh, my God, some you just spent like forty five million dollars and you got two million dollars back. Like, I mean, you know, what I mean, like, oh, I feel yeah. like maybe over time, like this movie would be able to pay itself back as far as with dvd rentals and everything else because this is big with like the whole blockbuster video and everything else right oh yeah and cable tv it was on comedy central and stuff all the time yeah so it definitely ended up making its money back and it has a cult following 
as recent as 2017, Stephen Baldwin was saying that he wanted to do a sequel with Polly Shore, which is really weird when you consider that Baldwin is now like his life is Christian ministry and he like travels around talking to kids. Like he's like the cool guy who turns his chair around backwards. Oh, he's like, no. let me rap at you about JC in the heat Z. Maybe that's why I never hear of anything that happens with that dude anymore. I was blindsided in researching that fellow. I have the weirdest trivia you could imagine. Shall I get in the competition for this week? Yeah, man. So this film came out January 12th, 1996. Let me regale you with the competition because I think this might speak to one of the elements as to why this film just kind of tanked. 12 Monkeys came out on the 2nd. On the 12th, you had Don't Be a Menace in South Central While Drinking Your Juice in the Hood. The 17th, so you had From Dust Till Dawn. February 2nd, you had Black Sheep. February 16th, you had Happy Gilmore. Yeah, there's no way that succeeds in any of those weeks. So, yeah, good luck. I mean, sorry. I, it's That's super rough. And this is, like, you know, I think we can kind of agree that, like, Adam Sandler kind of took the mantle of, like, the Pauly Shore bad comedy thing and ran with it. And so by this point, Pauly Shore's shtick was kind of viewed as outdated. And apparently he claims that he was going to be doing another movie for another company where he was in like it was set in Europe and he was this different thing. And apparently Disney bought the rights to that script to make him do in the army now, which he thinks like tanked his career. It's super interesting to hear like his perspective of like why his career ended up like failing and kind of glancing over just he didn't even give like logical excuses as to like, oh, well, like, for instance, if you look at what I was competing against at this market, like it's an oversaturated thing or, or any of these other issues. So uh, we'll get into it. But this definitely seems to haunt him, which is sad. It's the lowest grossing Pauly Shore film of all time, even lower than Jury Duty, which brought in $17 million. Can you believe that? <laughs> yeah, man. I don't know. Between this and like uh, Son-in-Law. <laughs> I like Son-in-Law. I love In the Army now, even though it's a blatant ripoff of Stripes with Bill Murray, which was originally actually going to be a Cheech and Chong film. Weird. Really? Yeah, dude. Oh, that's interesting. All, all I remember from him once upon a time is when he would say, like, munching on some grande. The weasel. Oh, I'll be honest. <laughs> I've never been a huge fan of Encino Man, which is kind of weird because I do like Brendan Fraser and other stuff. Yeah, yeah. Whatever happened to that guy, Brendan Fraser? He did, like, the mummy stuff and then... He said it like broke his body. And so now he has like some kind of issues with like weight management and stuff. But he did the voice of Robot Man in DC's Doom Patrol. So oh, okay. there's that. I, I mean, mean, it it's kind of neat when you still have actors who maybe aren't exactly like the heartthrobs they once were still involved somehow in like movies or behind the scenes stuff with voice acting, you know? Yeah. And I think it's it's really interesting that basically any actor, if they get old enough, can be like forlorn and have like a career resurgence, you know? Yeah, I mean, as long as you just push for it. Yeah, definitely. Like, look at um, Mickey Rourke. That guy couldn't act, and then he did The Wrestler, and he's like, me, I'm sad, and I'm going to die, me. Yeah, I mean, what's the fucking guy from Star Wars? God, everybody's going to hate me. He does all that voiceover shit. The voiceover Luke shit. Sky, Luke Sky. Oh, Mark Luke's Hamill. Dude, Mark Hamill. Mark Hamill, so there hard. you go. That's what I'm saying. You know, Mark Hamill, he's like, yeah, fucking Star Wars, like crazy. And then he did that fucking one with the... Crip Keeper guy, or the not not the Crip Keeper guy, but the the guy who God, I'm so bad with names. He is like the Crip Keeper, and he's really a mortician. We did a fucking episode oh, body bags. on it. Yeah, yeah, he was in one of the body bag episodes, right? Yeah. And then you're like, and then he just disappears. He had well, like a fucking sweet mustache. He was also in The Giver. Can I tell you about how I hate people because of that movie? So Go I had on. seen The Giver, which is based on an anime. It was, uh, I think it's Bio Suit Giver. Where a guy gets this like alien technology and becomes a super fighting killing machine and fights. Isn't these that men. isn't that like a, a cartoon where like it, a it kid is as well. turns into it? <laughs> yeah, there's a cartoon, there's a manga, there's and then there's two live ben action 10. movies. The Ben Ten, I think. That's a ripoff. Don't even oh, don't even never don't even. never mind. It's too soon. <laughs> Flagrant ripoff. But anyway, I remember seeing The Giver on cable at my grandma's house. And so I go to warehouse video. This is how long ago this was, and I'm like, dude. I want to see this movie. It's called The Giver. Like, I will pay you all of my allowance forever if I can watch this movie again. Because for me, it's perfect. It's like violent Power Rangers, right? And the guy's like, I think you mean Mac Giver. And I was like, I think the and Mac are different words. Fuck with. <laughs> and so from then on, I just never ask for help if I'm in a store anymore. It's like, I'll figure it out. Yeah. I mean, you can't be any 
more different between the two, right? MacGyver and the Giver. I mean, if you look at the story and everything in between, like you're like, wait, one guy just creates things out of toothpicks and tennis balls and everything else. And the other is like this aliens and superpowers and all kinds of shit. So imagine one's clearly the a lot better power than the other. of Mac Giver, but instead of a paperclip, he has the Giver suit. Whoa. <laughs> very good. Very good. So this film, 95 minutes long. Did you love it? Yeah, again, it's it's the golden shower of minutes, I guess you would call it. It's not the golden hour, right? It's the golden shower. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a nice peace stream on my face. <laughs> I, lo- I think it's a great time. I could see how you'd argue that that second act kind of lags a little bit when they're doing the montage, but the fact is it's a montage. Like, they just kind of quickly go over the homeostasis and blah, blah, and then it's the end of the movie. Like, and it sets up the best idea for a sequel ever. I I love the ending to this movie. It's so dumb, but it's so great. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like honestly, the only thing the montage is missing was the song where it's like do 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 do. Excellent. So the film was directed by Jason Bloom, which was actually his feature film directorial debut. The only other film he directed was Overnight Delivery with Paul Rudd a couple of years later. He did a couple episodes of Veronica Mars and iZombies, but then he's really kind of hit his niche being an executive producer on films such as Criminal, Survivor, and The Hitman's Bodyguard. Never heard of any of those. The Hitman's Bodyguard, Samuel Jackson, and Ryan Reynolds, and they're like, meh. Oh, that's the newer one, right? It came out maybe like you. Oh, okay. Yep. Never saw it. Neither did I, but I mean, still. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, I've already seen Ryan Reynolds play the Deadpool character like five separate times now. Right. In all these different movies. And you're like, you're the same exact guy, like just played, portrayed differently. Like uh, that one, what? Blade trilogy. Same exact guy. Yeah. Right. And then, so did you see the Netflix movie that he he came out with? Oh, the Michael Bay one? it's like with all of un- everybody's like numbers, there's no names to them. And he creates like a super magnet and shit. It was really fun to watch. I mean, visually pleasing because A, Michael Bay and B, just because I love all kinds of action and shit exploding. But there wasn't a lot of substance to it. But, you know, it was good. I didn't see it. But I mean, I heard people like nobody said really mean shit, which was shocking to me. You know, yeah. when it comes to who's his facey, what's his name? It's almost always like, oh, everything Michael Bay does is not The Rock, so fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you're right. Written by Kip Caning and Scott Marcano, and the story was done by Adam Leff, Mitchell Peck, and Jason Blumenthal. Apparently, it was huh. conceived as being more of a serious film, and then MGM was like, no, 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 no. It's silly. This is dumb. Scott Marcano, going back to horror, wrote Sanitarium from 2013, starring Malcolm McDowell, who was in A Clockwork Orange, which we just reviewed. And if you haven't downloaded that episode, (laughs) you should download that episode because our downloads suck in the quarantine. Oh, man, it was a fun episode. I like that movie a lot. (laughs) Produced by Bradley Jenkel, Brad Crivoy, and Steven Stabler. Stabular in the throat, maybe. Did any of those guys produce anything else? Didn't look. Uh, yeah. Uh, honestly, I was kind of perusing through the old IMDb and nothing really spoke to me. You know what I mean? Well, if you look at the bi- the Biodome wiki on Wikipedia, it's really bad. Like so many of these people didn't do like anything else. For instance, <laughs> Brad Cravoy is the only uh-huh. one of the three who even has a Wikipedia page. And I mean, that dude's career is pretty dope. He was also the producer for Dumb and Dumber. So, I mean, he's actually oh, okay. done a yeah. lot of stuff. You know, what's really sad is, honestly, I could make a Wikipedia page about you. And there are the people who have actually worked on this movie that do not have Wikipedia pages. So <laughs> that in itself is pretty sad. Yeah. My, our show can't have a Wikipedia, though. Why Apparently, not? you need like certain follower statistics or something like that. Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah, it's also really embarrassing when you try to create a Wikipedia for your own show. <laughs> These this are the show coolest is great. guys ever. <laughs> I would totally, totally give Jake a hand job, which I've been doing almost every single day since I was eleven, maybe even younger than that. <laughs> I heard Jake has a negative two and a half inch ween. Woo! Continuity episode <laughs> to episode. That's why you gotta tune in each week. Thanks. Slash pod at gmail.com. <laughs> the music was by Andrew Gross. He did eight heads in a duffel bag, which is barely great. legal. 
and Tenacious D, Pick of Destiny, which coincides with uh, Jack Black and Kyle Gass being in the actual movie. Deactivated so. lasers with my dick. <laughs> Great. Now I'm going to have to go listen to that entire album after this. You're welcome. Yeah. So, and can we also just talk about the amazing soundtrack throughout the movie? What, Reverend it's pretty Morton damn Heat, good. Faith No More. Who else do we got? We got Voodoo, Voodoo Glow Schools with Shoot the Moon. Um, I Want Candy. Um, the Spider Man theme song by the Ramones. Hell yeah. I mean, the fucking safety dance. I mean, come on. Like, all kinds of shit. It's pretty cool. So, fun thing, when I pitched doing this movie to you, it was because I've been listening to the safety dance with my little child because she's a small cherub and she looks like the midgets from the music video. <laughs> so, we run around my living room doing the S dance. Yeah, you know, Michelle and I were doing that earlier. I She had never seen the, the music video for that oh, song. Oh, no. Yeah, so I showed it to her and I was like, okay, I was trying to describe it before I showed it to her and I was like, imagine you're in like willow times and everybody's <laughs> just doing like the S, the S safety dance stuff. And she's like, huh? I'm like, just watch. It gets amazing. And there's like random kids with a little twirly ribbon and then there's like two people wearing chicken heads and they're like cockfighting apparently. I don't know. It's kind of fun. It's pretty great, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty cool. So shall we get into the nicknames? Dick names. Snick names. Prick names. Are we gonna do you want to do the one upsmanship again or you just want to get into it? I feel like I might get tired some week. Let's just get let's just get into it. So Polly Shore plays Bud Squirrel Macintosh, not a weasel, but a squirrel. Thought that was kind of fun. Did you have anything for him? I honestly have nothing for him. He is uh, an enigma in his own. I really just want to call him Polly. <laughs> yeah, I think that's kind of fair. He... Or or squirrel, you know. It's 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 kind of hard when the movie provides nicknames for you. Right. I think that's fair. <laughs> so you're like, okay, so one's Bud and one's Squirrel. Um, I we're, I'm a, I want to run with it. There you go. This film almost starred Dana Gould and Harland Williams. I found out from uh, Polly Shore's own podcast. So that's pretty amazing. Usually I don't get into the whole like alternate casting thing, but you remember Harlan Williams is the guy from Rocket Man. It wasn't me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. From yeah, Half-Baked. Yeah. So, from Half-Baked, right. Okay. He wants to, he's like, I, I'm you somebody's are, bitch. <laughs> you are a homo sapien. Oh my God. I said homo. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, he's great. Yeah. So we'll move on. Stephen Baldwin as Doyle Stubbs Johnson. He says that he gets recognized for this film more than anything else he's ever done. Can you believe it? Honestly, it's a pretty memorable movie, especially for him. I think it's the the haircut, really. I mean, he won an award for it. Yeah. Or he was nominated for it, I should say. But like, you know, as far as other stuff he was in, like usual suspects, I feel like it's just like such a small role, it, which seems weird for that movie and how great it is but he's not like one of the main guys you know what i mean yeah. like i almost i almost think of like benicio del toro more so than i think of stephen baldwin yeah he's like a glorified extra in that movie but you know the tone and the severity and the grandness and the scale of that film the year before and then does this film and i get you're trying to like you always want to leverage and move up with your next thing and so i'm sure he goes oh i was a background character in this big movie and if i'm the lead in a somewhat smaller movie that still might help with my career his brother Alec warned him this would kill his career. And he was still like, <laughs> okay, yeah, sure, bro. And it oh, killed his no. career. He actually declared bankruptcy in June of 2009. Yeah, that's a bummer. That's, yeah. Well, it that's is what after it is. he was on Ty Murray's Celebrity Bull Riding Challenge in 2007, wherein he broke his shoulder. Yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I'm not really sure how well people do like the celebrities when it comes to these like road rules, real world celebrity bullshit, this or that. But I can't I usually the people they pick up are some that are on the down and outs and they're like, oh, yeah, dude, bargain bin. Let's just fucking pick them up. See what happens. Yeah, like Flavor Flav, the guy who was like, <laughs> hey, Chuck D, I'm public enemy. And Chuck D's like, actually, you're not. You're a reality right. TV star. Go sing your sob story to Brigitte Nielsen, am I right? I was going to say, and then he was like all about Brigitte, and then you looked at her, and then you looked at him, and you're like, uh, this is a train wreck. Yeah. Other movies that Mr. Baldwin has been in, Flintstones, Viva Rock Vegas, and I've actually seen this movie, Sharks in Venice, and it's as bad as it sounds. Oh, dude. I can't believe I forgot about Flintstones. He plays Barney. But it's it's Rock Vegas. The first one, it's Rick Moranis, and it's awesome. It's, yes, that's true. That's true. So Rick Moranis and John Goodman. 
John Goodman. I was like, big dude, fucking Roseanne. What's his face? Yeah, John Goodman. That was a great movie. That's fun. Rosie O'Donnell. I'll always remember when she's sweeping up and they're living, they're homeless and they're out in the woods or whatever. So she sweeps up a bunch of dust and looks around and realizes she's outside. So she just blows the dust out. I think about that every <laughs> time I do any kind of cleaning in my house because we live in this fucking dust bowl. Yeah, yeah. I think the only thing I remember from that movie or you know, there's, a, there's a few things, but like one of the main things I remember is the disgusting pig that is the garbage disposal <laughs> yeah. underneath the sink. That's so funny. It reminds me of the gross little like green creature from Evolution, which is it you who hasn't seen Evolution with David Duchovny? Never seen it. Okay, so spoiler alert, <laughs> your boys might be reviewing that in this April Fool's Month bullshit. That movie fucking rips hard. Did you know Stephen Baldwin is the father-in-law of one Justine Baber? I did know that. I did know that. I found I that I, out with this. Once upon a time, I feel like on Instagram, I was like, hey, this girl's kind of cute. And then it was Haley Bieber. And I was like, or Haley, whatever the fuck her name is, um, Baldwin, right? Yeah. And then, and then she was like, oh, hey, here's my fiance. And it was Justin Bieber. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm just going to unfollow you now because I'm <laughs> Bieber. Okay. We could talk about this. I have a very similar <laughs> policy. Katy Perry really, really enjoyed her. And then she married Russell Brand. And I was like, even if my wife gave me a hall pass, even if <laughs> there's no way you're off, you are tainted, you're, you're acidic, mm -hmm. dead soil to me. I will never Fine. plant my seed in now. Forever unclean. <laughs> <laughs> There's not enough Lysol in the world. And trust me, I've been to Costco. I know how much Lysol there is in the world. Yeah, that's right. That's so right. Baldwin converted to Roman Catholicism after the 9-11 attacks. And I thought I found this was really weird. So Polly Shore is being interviewed. And so the guy interviewing Polly says, I met your Biodome co-star, co Stephen Baldwin, a few years back, and it was a kind of weird experience. I told him I was hard of hearing. And when I told him that, he put his hand on my head and tried to cure me of my deafness. Do you remember him doing anything weird like that on the film set? And so Polly was basically like, nah, he's just basically like born again. And he's like, if he wasn't born again, he'd be like a drug addict or a crazy person. So he's actually kind of glad that he found Jesus. Yeah, dude, that's so weird, man. I mean, how awkward does it have to be for like the, the person that's interviewing him to like have somebody literally place their hands on your head and try to cure something that is like scientifically like, OK, no, there's a reason for this yeah and what you're doing is uh, i don't know you're not <laughs> yeah, john constantine I, I, fuck off it seems so strange you know like yeah. i feel like what was that john travolta movie where he like fucking, phenomenon yeah phenomenon i was like he was trying to phenomenon somebody right now phenomenon so gay oh we're twins he's in the brain stem he supported <laughs> Donald Trump, which is kind of disappointing, but apparently he has 17 tattoos, including a small HM for Hannah Montana, which he got to try and get a role on her show, which never actually happened. Wah, wah, wah. Is that the saddest thing you've ever heard? Yeah, that's that's not good. I mean, it's like the opposite of good. Yeah, I feel like he had some poor life choices. Oh, he's actually posed with Hannah Montana with the tattoo. That's weird. How much do you think he had to beg and plead to get that photo? She's like, ha ha ha. Um, sure. You're um Alec Baldwin, right? And he's like, Yeah, yeah, that's me. I'm Alec Baldwin. <laughs> yeah, he it's weird. He's a weird guy. But you know, yeah. good for him. You know? So I question. I don't really know too much about the Baldwins. There's quite a few, right? There's Steven, there's Alec, there's another one, I think. Um, were they like child stars or like are their parents like in movies? I don't know. I feel like so the four Dave Baldwin brothers are Alec, Daniel, William, and Stephen. Then they had like very famous wives. Kim Basinger was probably the most famous, and then the two most famous of the Baldwin children would be Ireland and then Haley, who's married to Justine Bebert. Okay, so nobody uh, famous like from their parents or like their parents weren't like actors or actresses or anything. Well, there was Alexander Ray Baldwin Sr., uh, but he doesn't have his own Wikipedia page, according to this. So he must not have been that famous. I feel like everybody I mean, and you know, it makes sense. Everybody has their own kind of path through life, I guess. They just all ended up being um, 
in movies and whatnot. But, you know, I mean, it's just it seems strange that they all made it onto the big screen in some shape or form. And, you know, they all had different variances of success. It's kind of like the Stallone family where you have you can't afford Sylvester. So you get Frank. That's kind of the way it was where it's like you can't get Alec. Steven's right there. (laughs) <laughs> it's very, yeah right yeah it's very different than the arquette family for instance because arquette was first generation was cliff lewis and then you have obviously our boy david and his uh, sister uh, rosanna and patricia and then uh sister alexis so uh, yeah i remember alexis is a super brave person to be coming out as trans when she did you know this is what was this the early 2000s now people are cool but back then people demonized that poor woman. was that um was she in Pulp Wedding Fiction. Singer? Oh, was she? I thought some. I thought an Arquette was in Wedding Singer, but I could. Yeah, be wrong. you're right. She is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, she's the one that's doing the singing, you know. And she's like, "Do you really want to hurt me? Do you remember that movie? Oh yeah, it was a great movie for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just realized that she died in 2000. Oh, on September 11, 2016. The probably oh. the greatest catastrophe to ever happen on that day in American history, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah. R.I.P. Mm-hmm. William Atherton played Dr. Noah Faulkner. You might remember as Thornburg and Die Hard, Walter Peck and Ghostbusters, Jeffrey Hathaway in Real Genius, and this fool has the same birthday as Arnie Schwartz, which huh, for normal people is Arnold Schwarzenegger. This yeah. dude play is like one of the greatest character actors for like a shitty, smug little villain ever. Like I yep, love he, to hate this man. Yeah, he plays the same kind of actor or same character in like every movie he's in. And it's amazing. Every single one of his roles, like in Die Hard, you're just like, oh, this fucking piece of shit. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. He's a sleazeball that totally hits on um, Holly. Well, and then he she punches him in the face because he exploits the family and he goes and does an interview with their kids while she's not home. Remember, yeah. he like threatens her housekeeper. He's like, I'm going to call INS and Border Patrol. So I'm gonna <laughs> fuck you in the face. Yeah, man. He's like, I don't know. I feel like he's the epitome of like adult wild male, white male privilege. Yes, exactly. He's the embodiment <laughs> of that like shitty, smug little like. Like so, like it's, there's a certain degree of cowardice with like really staunch rule followers that bothers me. And I'm even coming yeah. as like an attorney who's like, you know, I, I'm all about rules because that's how I make a living. But you know, there's a certain degree of like that I just can't stand. I'm like, oh, my knuckles can only get so tense, motherfucker. Oh man, that's good. <laughs> Joey Lauren Adams was Monique. She played the girl who took Bud's virginity on Married with Children. She was also in like. All of the things that I grew up watching. Yeah. I mean, days to, days to confuse. You had Coneheads. You had Mallrats. She and, was uh, big, chasing Amy. big Daddy. Yep. Yeah. So I mean, it, one of the things I think I remember from Big Daddy was when he was just like, "Stay out of the frozen food section. You might freeze your tits." <laughs> she gets she gets fake boobs. She has really pointy nips in this movie too. It's like yeah. Well, I thing. don't. I was gonna say I don't think bras were part of like you know her whole little costume getup like at all. Yeah. Teresa Hill, her co-host, I think she's actually a realtor now, or a co-host, co-star, whatever, who played Jen, Doyle's girl. So there's that. Rose McGowan was Denise. Uh, I love me some Rose McGowan. You might remember she's in Scream. She's the lady who gets killed by a door. It's adorable. <laughs> yeah, didn't she? So she was one of the main people that came out against the slime ball, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Wein- Weinstein. Yeah, yeah. okay. And he has he has a beer virus, which is kind of cool. I mean, maybe he dies from it. I don't want him to die. I want him to suffer. Well, eh, I guess. Look, you rape that many women or you take advantage of that many women. I'm just saying that if one guy rapes him in prison a day for the rest of his life, he <laughs> might finally get caught up. Uh, that's true. I just imagine him like having trouble breathing and it just is like a slow, painful death. That dude clearly looks like he snores and has sleep apnea, so he could probably die. He definitely looks like he could be a troll from like one of the Lord of the Rings movies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just use some airbrush and make him a little gray. Dude, he could be the Goblin King for all I know. Okay, that is wrong. And that's an offensive <laughs> thing to say because you cannot compare <laughs> David Bowie and his amazing crotch in that film with those writing oh, pants. Oh, no. To this I was pool. going off The Hobbit. My bad. Oh, the one with the goiter. Yeah. Okay. He yeah, could be that yeah, guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was going, Goblin King, Goblin King, take this child of mine far away from me. Yeah, what no, is not that, that rubbish? Cool. It doesn't even start with I wish. 
not that cool ass Goblin King. I mean, come on. Come on. You should know better. Dude, that fella can play with my balls anytime. Hey yo. <laughs> hey yo. Especially especially with that bulge throughout the film. Oh, my God. Dude, there's a scene where Hoggle's <laughs> like, oh, not the bark of eternal stench. And his face is right next to his cock. I've probably freeze framed on that a million times. <laughs> and I touch my bulge. When I there think you about you, I touch my bulge. Oh. <laughs> Uh, so we good. had Taylor Negron as Russell. Uh, I think probably one of the highlights of this film when I was a kid was when he's like, Russell, how did you get a job fucking President Clinton? You've had sex with President Clinton? That's so good, dude. And it's funny because that Taylor Negron guy plays the same kind of actor or the same character in all of his roles as well. Like he's just kind of schmarmy and he's like always rolling his eyes and being like a fucking wise ass. 100%. He, like, he's like the embodiment of like a sassy cat. agreed agreed and then everybody else is kind of just i would like to mention kevin west as tc romulus because he's in the super mario brothers movie which is fucking awesome right i mean i guess you gotta give you know credit to uh jb and and kg from tenacious d but it's oh yeah super quick and it's funny because i completely forgot they were in this until they play them off screen and it's just like very subtle. You can hear a little bit of it. And I was like, that sounds like that sounds like Jack Black. And then Michelle's like, huh? And then all of a sudden it shows him like really quickly. I'm like, oh, my God, I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> I smell it on you. Yeah. yeah. So let's and then get I, I gave I gave myself a high five. I was like, yes, high five. <laughs> I remembered the things. <laughs> That's it. We're going to get into the slay by play. Hand slappy hoo ha. Yep. Slay by play. Do you like the credits of this film? The like MTV? Uh, yeah. I mean, honestly, was he uh, like an MTV DJ at this time or VJ or whatever the fuck you would call he him? He wasn't at this time? anymore, but he was previously. So it really. I mean, you got to imagine it, it probably carried over in some shape. Oh, yeah. I thought it's, I think it's great. It's so like it's such a period piece like this movie is the time that it happened in right yeah oh absolutely wholeheartedly i was actually really surprised he didn't sneak in any of like his scarves right like in <laughs> son-in-law where he's one scarf i feel like steven tyler owes Polly shore a debt of gratitude for giving him yeah his no kidding sense. man no kidding yeah i mean honestly if you were to look at who is probably a little more instrumental when it comes to the scarf game yeah it's probably it's probably prince but I mean, then it's probably, yeah. And then it's probably Polly Shore. <laughs> For dudes who can't sing, it's definitely Polly Shore. <laughs> so uh, I really love in the flashback sequence when they're sniffing each other's farts, how he looks like he used to when he was a VJ with the big, you know, curly, flowing hair and everything. Oh, yeah. And Stephen oh, yeah. Baldwin looks like one of the guys from fucking Rammstein, who apparently I don't all really... have the coronavirus. What the fuck is that? Yeah. I'm... Oh, really? Yeah, I read a critical condition and stuff. I'm like, Jesus Christ, man, wash your hands. The guy with the giant fake dick that sprays cum on his audience. Do you remember that being a thing? Wait, 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 wait. No, that's, that's, um, no, I know you're thinking war, but Romstein did it too. There's a big old article. Yeah, it was crazy. I was like, uh, interesting. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, not a big, anyways. It's just, I mean, what Polly Shore as, you know, in the, the little, scene where they go back in time and they're like sniffing each other's farts it seems like his character would look like that but then you look at stephen baldwin's character and how they portrayed him and i don't know it just seemed weird like none of it seemed like it would like translate to what he is now but i guess that's the funny part of it exactly like he's just like this weird flippant oddball (laughs) who looks like like an extra from the neil gaiman sandman comics like what the fuck is this and he's wearing makeup (laughs) It's, it's awesome yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, and you know, what's funny is that's another part of this movie that I will always remember. And it's so subtle to the actual movie or it's like it's so minor. Yeah. Right. You're like, just like, OK, this is just like this, like super small flashback. But I remember clearly as a kid being like, OK, Kyle, OK, Kyle, OK, Kyle, I'm going to fart. And I want you to tell me if you can totally tell me what I had before I farted. And I mean, obviously, it just smells like poop. But well, then your brother lived with you, so he'd be like, "Uh, checks mix," and you were like, "What?" <laughs> and then I'm like, "Don't get too close, pink eye," because right. <laughs> so the film starts, and the boys are like in their house, and they're like, Bleh. and Bud hits Doyle with a book so that they can get out of like picking up garbage for Earth Day. And then as he's explaining it to the girlfriends, he's like, "Free mahi mahi, free." 
And I've always wanted to own a sushi restaurant so I could do some kind of buy one, get one free <laughs> mahi mahi. That's so good. Like if anybody gives you a tip or something, everybody would just have to stop what they're doing and just be like, free mahi mahi. And yeah, I love that's good. So we're going to go like the, everything that Doyle had happen in his life is incredibly fucked up. When he comes to, he says, please let me out, mommy, or at least slide another pancake under the door. That That's so implies some serious childhood trauma, like a movie we did last week, A One Hour Photo. Yeah, it's, it's pretty morbid, right? And I mean, there's multiple instances where they're just like, what happened to you? And he's like, I don't know. My parents have always wondered the same thing. Oh, yeah. Right? Where did you come from? My mom and the authorities are still trying to figure that one out. Wait, what? <laughs> Say again? Because as a oh, kid, I dude. thought that meant that he was like found, like he was like an alien or something. No, no. That implies something far worse. Right, right. And you know what's kind of crazy is I feel like you can actually almost believe that they're brothers in this instead of like just two really close friends. Well, Doyle's mom even says, it's really like I have two sons, Bud and Doyle. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess so. I just, for me, when I'm watching this once upon a time, I just always thought to myself like, oh yeah, these are two brothers that are just like going and in, getting into all kinds of crazy fucking shenanigans. Just because you know? we're in a bubble doesn't mean we can't cause any trouble. Uh, I like it. Right on. So when the girls find out they get super cranky and they call him them from you know the activities they're doing and they basically fabricate this story, they're going to go with these swimmers from the local college and, uh, you know, a finagle. And Do- <laughs> Bud says, we've talked it over and you can't go with the guys to the kangaroo. No, no. And then he very seriously, as if it's like an action film, Doyle, our girls have been seduced by breaststrokers. <laughs> and they say grape smugglers. I mean, some of these things, like I don't understand how you could nominate him as the worst actor ever because that is so much better than so many actors we've covered on this show. Oh, absolutely. I mean, would it be too much to say maybe Academy Award winning stuff right there? <laughs> I would. Let me tell you this. <laughs> this movie deserves an Academy Award more than Parasite. Fucking quote me on it. Oh, dude. Oh, man. I will not let it go. That movie is so fucking boring. And this movie, it moves with rapid pace. This movie's, you know, hitting the back of your cervix like a, like a fucking shore you can uppercut <laughs> over and over. And you're just like, give me more. Give me more. All right. <laughs> so... They drive, and as they're driving to like go stop them at Vasquez Lake, he throws a firecracker and blows up a fucking bunny, which is the saddest thing in the world. That was the most random thing ever. I don't know. I was just like, huh? Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Whatever. As they're driving, they drive past the biodome. Biodome, you think that means it goes both ways? That's funny. I thought that was pretty damn funny. And then another like dark ass flashback when they get to Vasquez Lake, it's a flashback of Doyle's mom holding Bud under the water and says, great, Bud, you're getting better. Let's see if you could do three minutes. That woman is the devil. Yeah. Yeah. Do they show? I feel like they show her later on in the movie, right? Yeah. She's all sugary sweet and she looks like, you know, kind of Dolly Parton-esque. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. So they are, you know, driving, right? And he has to take a piss. Yep. Right. He says, what does he say? There's something he says where he's like, I don't oh, know. Drain it's the not lizard. Some- okay. I was like, drain the main vein. Yeah, it's probably drain the lizard. That sounds better. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> did the microphone pick up the fart? I hope so. <laughs> it totally Brian, what's did. it smell like? Oh, fuck. I have a lemon head in my mouth and I had a lemon head mixed with fart. It made the fart taste worse. Oh, dude, that's gross. That's gross. So they- <laughs> there are some weird things where they have this like savant understanding. So they get to the biodome when they break in using firecrackers. And there's a reference to the JFK assassination where they oh, say, dude, that's it came so from weird. the grassy knoll, assassins, assassins, holy Kennedy. And he says that he's going to have a Rip Van Tinkle Fest, which is a literary reference as if he even knows how to sing. And then, <laughs> dude, full on fucking Sig Heil's the security guard. Like, what is happening here? This is crazy. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely one of the instances throughout the movie where you're like, yep, definitely wouldn't be able to get away with doing that nowadays. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> so they get inside, blah, blah. The pickup line where he's like, are you fruit at the bottom or stirred? Am I overly vegan and thinking that's just a fucking disgusting pickup line? It always creeps me out. I just, it's fucking gross. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know. I, I didn't really get it at first. And I was just like, oh, 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 you were talking about it. Never mind. <laughs> That's gross. Um, I love all the pickup lines, though. It totally reminded me of the... Did it hurt? The two brothers, the, the two brothers, the Steve and Doug Utabi. Yes. And they're just like, me, Ooh. you, you, me, me, you. <laughs> And she's like, what are you doing? And you're like, that's the sound of the ambulance to take me away when you stop my heart. <laughs> so good. Yeah, that's pretty good. So then they do the Iron Man song, and it's the best thing of all time. How's it go? Iron, Iron Man, Man, Iron Man, Iron does Man. whatever an iron can, pancake flat like a glove. And then <laughs> Faulkner interrupts and is just like, He's that like, is Spider-Man. That is Spider-Man. Black <laughs> Sabbath did Iron Man. I was like, yeah. I would really love to see him as Robert Downey Jr.'s villain in another Iron Man movie. <laughs> Alternate universe right there. Dude, it'd be good. so sick. So <laughs> Dr. Leakey ends up like, oh, well, they represent the chaos element. So just ignore that. It was fully planned. And they just kind of go about their stuff. And they're you know going through and acting just really stupid. One of my favorite scenes of this entire movie is when they prank Olivia and they go to the door acting like they don't know that they're locked in. And so they start slamming their heads against the door and everything. And it's clearly not an airtight door because light's coming through underneath it, but whatever. And so they're like, so what you're saying is we're stuck in 12 months, 52 weeks, 385, 385 days. days. And she says yes because she's so frustrated. It's so fucking funny. Yeah, it's so good. And it's funny because I, I clearly remember as a kid watching this and saying to myself, is this what Bud does? He just ran, runs into things over and over again with his head. Yes, <laughs> sure this, is, <laughs> this is his shtick. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Everybody's got their thing. I say butt fucking. He slams his head into stuff. It's no big deal. <laughs> yeah. It's almost like you remember the cartoon Ed, Ed and Eddie. I love it. He's Ed. <laughs> and then, oh my God. But then that makes Bud has to be Eddie. And then who, Eddie. Is there a double I don't D? Know. Oh, uh, I don't know Romulus who... is double D. There you go. That's true because he ends up kind of being like the cool guy anyways. Yeah. Like, Hello, yeah. light. Buttered toast. <laughs> Who's Johnny two by four in this roach? Yeah, it's probably roach. I could say that. And then purple sticky punch is clearly the jawbreakers in this scenario, right? <laughs> yeah, man. It kind of makes you, it, it makes me wish that they had some kind of little montage or something where everybody just got really stoned and did stupid shit. Kind of like uh, breakfast club. Or they all just like dance around and like do fucking karate chops and, and shit. You mean like the safety <laughs> dance montage? Well, I mean, there is that. But that's more, yeah. it's it's portrayed as being because of the song, not because they're like toked. You know, right, dude? Yeah. Is absolutely. that a cool I mean, thing to say? Says the straight edge guy who's like, <laughs> yeah, I think. No, actually, toked isn't really a thing. Do you, so. Did you get ripped on your bongs? <laughs> Even better. So later on, they're having dinner and they're really grossed out by the food. Another strange oh, cause thing. Because it's, it's, is it tofu, right? Exactly. Or it's soy or something? Are you yeah. killer tofu? Tofu, killer tofu. And Bud says, avez-vous a cigarette? Which is to say, uh, do you have a cigarette in French? And I'm like, how the fuck does he even know what French is? But all right. And then later on, so you have Monique is watching the news with Russell. Russell, you know, I, I, we're out at the pens. I hit, I hurt my bladder rollerblading. Hilarious. <laughs> but then he's like talking about her. Like, if I were you, I'd go out and hump for the next year. And she Dude, says, so weird. If I were you, I'd have my mouth full of shotgun with a toe in the trigger. Kurt Cobain committed suicide for eight ninety four. Just a little when, over wait, a year before this movie came out. Oh, wow. Okay. I was like, so wait, did this come out before or after? Okay. After, so yeah. I'm so like, so Kurt, Kurt Cobain, I was like, Kurt Cobain watched this and I was like, oh shit. And there we go. That's how I'm doing it. <laughs> Could you imagine that? <laughs> Polly Shore drove Kurt Cobain to kill himself. It's canonical. I mean, honestly, that would probably make Polly Shore a little more famous than he actually is, but for sure. <laughs> Another dark ass music reference is when Romulus is talking about the Lepidaptera and Doyle says, didn't their drummer lose an arm? Because of oh, Def, Def Leppard. Leopard. Dude, oh, it's so dark. I'm like, fuck, man. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. So when they're being banished for all their shenanigans, they go out into the desert. And you can actually see like the tarp kind of ceiling flopping. And so people are like, oh, my God, inconsistency. I'm like, you're not watching this movie for continuity. You're watching this for hilarious, <laughs> dumb fuckery. What I love is when they get back to their car and they find the boot, the first thing they do upon escaping the biodome is get pizza. No, they they fucking litter with the parking tickets. They're like, oh yeah, 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 yeah. 
<laughs> that's so good and it's funny because right after they get like banished to like the desert you can imagine like it hadn't taken very long like it was maybe like a course of like an hour before they're like laying on the ground there's like holes all over their like yeah. fucking shirts and stuff it's pretty funny you gotta love it so they leave the biodome they get the pizza this is the russell thing Russell says basically their girlfriends are off slobbing knobs. And again, <laughs> a really weird, clever reference from Doyle who says that she, no, his girl's not going to be swapping Mark Spitz, which is a callback to them being swimmers because Mark Spitz was an American swimmer. It's like, how are you that clever? You're just the dumbest person alive, which I kind of love, though, because this to me doesn't show like varying levels of intellect. It's like he's a, an idiot savant. Did you get that vibe? Yeah, 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 yeah. I got that as well. It's like only on certain subjects where the, he's just like it almost seems like he gets hit in the head one too many times. And then all of a sudden he turns on his smart button and yeah. he's like, oh, shit, let me just like spout out some random nonsense or actually not 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 nonsense. It's something that's really intellectual. And then he gets hit in the head again and he's like, Oh, back to normal. Buttered toast. <laughs> so it cuts to the girlfriends with the other guys. This is where you get Tenacious D, which is awesome. So they get super jealous and they throw their own party. And it you know, you're killing the biodome. And then the girls find out the guys who they were kind of being seduced by are just trying to get laid. And so they're upset and they leave. And then Bud and Doyle to like, you know, regain their love and trust and honor bravely go to lock themselves into the biodome and i love so much it's like if anybody just stop me like do it now and russell's like please god let's let me go please that's <laughs> the funniest shit ever that's so good dude i just imagine him just like vegging out and be like ah you know what i kind of want to see how this rolls and then he's like nah you know what no nah, fuck this shit i'm out yep <laughs> do you think he actually swallowed the key no it pretty but it's damn funny good. that in three weeks we've had two movies where people swallow keys that's true i don't know if it was pasta <laughs> I don't think so. So they lock themselves in and basically they go on a quest to rebuild the biodome. And one of the things that's great is, you know, Romulus calls him a simian or Doyle. Romulus calls Doyle a simian at the beginning of the movie. And Doyle replies with dick. And so after he swallows the key and Romulus said nothing to stop him, he says dick back. And it's like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's so yeah, good. dude, that guy is so good. You know, what he kind of reminds me of who kind of looks like Manor James Keenan. Oh, one hundred percent, dude. <laughs> he also looks like the guy uh, who did the voice. I mean, of he Spongebob. also looks like he looks like the Dean from the Community too. Hell yeah, he reminds me of Tom Kenny. A bunch of great characters. So yeah, absolutely. So anyway, bum, 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 bum. oh yeah, another weird one. Doyle says, impossible is my nom de plume, which is pen name. And it's like, how do you know what that is? <laughs> but one of he's talking about, I never quit anything in my life except Chinese calligraphy, blah, 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 and masturbation. Okay, well, I didn't quit masturbation, but give me a break. It's the only thing I'm good at. And when Bud's like, you are very good at it. It's the That's funniest so shit ever. It's so weird, dude. I'm like, they got an interesting relationship, those two, huh? Oh, Maybe yeah. Maybe a little double Dutch rudder action going on there. Hey, there ain't nothing wrong with it. If you're both <laughs> jacking off, you're just jacking each other off. Is it gay? Yeah, yes. I mean, and you're not you're not touching their thing. It's you touching their hand or their arm that's touching their thing. So, oh, that's an interesting take. I could see that. I, I mean, that's honestly what the double Dutch rudder is, right? So, oh, that's what that they're, is. They're holding their dick, and then you grab their arm and you do the motion, and then they grab your arm as you have your hand in your dick, and you're just doing the motion of it. That's just masturbation with extra steps. <laughs> It's totally true. So they're trying to, you know, get them out. They're doing the Waco thing and they're playing the loud music and they play the safety dance. And this is where you get your great montage. And it's awesome because one of like a midget or a, a small person or a dwarf joins their safety dance dance. And they're in like a, they're in like a full on gesture outfit. So and you're good. just like, what? Where did any of this come in from? In a sealed bubble. It's a, So maybe <laughs> that is, Brian, to your point, maybe this is them all being high as fuck and it's a group hallucination. Yeah. I mean, I... I can imagine that some of those scientists, especially with all the different things that they're growing, would be like, hey, guys, I grew these mushrooms. Anybody yeah. want to take some? Well, you, you have the whole, you know, purple sticky punch where they yeah. advocate to grow some marijuana. I so, mean, there's definitely cows within the bubble. You you saw that. So, I mean, cow patties, you have fungus, you have mushrooms, hallucinogens. Yeah. Psilocybin is a fun guy. 
nothing. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. That was I was like, oh, dude, that's actually pretty funny. I mean, you, you know, your dad jokes, you got to have a, like a pretty good store of them, right? Because I mean, once she's old enough, you're going to let her have it nonstop, well, it's right? Because like my sense of humor is either dad jokes or fist fucking. And there's like no in between. <laughs> and I can't talk about one. So <laughs> did you catch when Dr. Leakey is after they've sealed themselves back in and he's talking about the fan mail and stuff? Phil Lamar reads some of the fan mail and Phil Lamar is the voice of Samurai Fist Fucking Jack. Dude, how cool is that? He's just an extra in this film. One of the greatest characters of all time. Yeah, Samurai Jack is badass. Do they still play that? Is that still around? I don't think it is. Yeah, they did a actually a, a rejuven, re, rejuvenation, revivication, resurrection. What do they call those things now? Was yeah. it was it good? Is it like the same style? Yeah. Or no? Yeah, oh, well, great. That's cool. That's cool. I really like that show. It was cool. So as they're going, um, you know, it's they're about to hit Earth Day and they're really close to hitting homeostasis and they find Faulkner has been walking around and he looks full on Unabomber at this point. He, he almost looks he almost looks like Alan Parrish in Jumanji. 100 percent. What year is it? <laughs> <laughs> so they find him planting coconuts around and he says, I have a lovely sack of coconuts, which is, of course, a reference to Merv Griffin's. I've got a lovely bunch of coconuts. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. You don't know but that it song? sounds good. No, no. Oh, no. It's, it's a fun, dumb song. <laughs> so as coconuts, though, how, I mean, how did he come across all of the things to make them? Nobody knows. I mean, it's just like, okay, you have some kind of detonators. They're all blinking lights. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, sure. it's weird. But, you know, don't get bogged down in details, man. Just live with it. It's true. It's true. I'm like, the, I'm like those people that are like, oh, look at the flappy fucking roof and shit. No, just pay attention to how stupid this movie is. So he tricks them into spreading the coconuts around. And then he goes to the computer and hacks it. And then he says, quote, my creation, I know thee not. Which is a reference to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Again, some great, cool references. So they play rock, paper, scissors when they figure out that it's bombs. And so earlier in the film, basically Bud beats Doyle every single time by using paper. So Doyle wises up and uses paper and loses. And Bud's just like, oh, what do you think of paper? It's great callbacks <laughs> yeah. working in threes. It's funny how every single time they were doing the Rochambeau, Bud would clearly wait like after uh, Doyle yeah, would cheats. do it. And then he would do his. So yeah, good. It's so funny. It's so funny. And so basically the bomb detonates, they escape and they bid farewell. And then as they're driving home, you know, Doyle has to pee again. So they go off to a you know, quote unquote uh, factory and you find out it's a nuclear test site and they're basically having Chernobyl too. And it's awesome. And then Faulkner runs off into the desert. And they're chasing him down. And they're like, where did he get a key? Thus implying he sifted through Doyle's shit and got the key. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's probably not the worst thing that guy did. So <laughs> you probably went full on uh, Bear Grylls and drank his own pee, dude. You looked kind of rough. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> he he'd had a go of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I mean, for me, honestly, I think this is it's a trashic. I could totally see that. For me, it's a classic because I think there is enough like artfulness in the creation of it, but I, it doesn't offend me. So I was thinking for this month, since we're doing like this kind of weird comedy yuck yuck shit, we're just going to have the King Fool. And so as of now, the King Fool is Biodome. Uh, we'll see what other episodes are to come. Now, Brian, are you ready for my horror double feature? Yeah, yeah, let's do it. I would pair this movie up with Cube, the Canadian film from 1997, which this movie is the exact antithesis of Biodome in certain ways. Made on a super shoestring budget of 350000 made $9 million bucks at the box office, which is a pretty great return. Wow, that's awesome. 90 minutes. It was directed by Vincenzo Natali, who had actually, he wrote the script, which originally was going to take place entirely in hell. And then, you know, when he has his script done, he did a short film called Elevated, which you can find on YouTube. It's about 20 minutes long. It's cut subtitles, but it's really fun. And it kind of, it's, when you have that as a companion to Cube, you'll love it. Cube ended up having a sequel and a prequel, which was uh, 
Cube 2 Hypercube, which is a terrible name, and Cube Zero, which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but I highly recommend those movies. You know, there's a ton of movies that are like it. it. It's also very reminiscent of the Twilight Zone episode Five Characters in Search of an Exit, which aired December 22nd, 1961. And that huh. is the horror recommendation to keep our bullshit credit, our street cred, to yeah, be yeah. a horror okay. podcast. Street cred, what, what? So, Brian, um, overall, are there any other horror films that you would pair with Biodome? That's just the one that came to mind because I'm the one who pitched Biodome, so I'm the one doing the pairing. We have a couple <laughs> that you're pitching, so you're going to do the pairing. Right, absolutely. Um, nah, actually, I I can't think of anything else that really comes to mind. You? You know, stuff in space, really, because it's the only thing where it's like, sealed right yeah okay i can see that so anything in, in particular or i don't know man life or something <laughs> there you go that stupid movie life where everybody becomes idiots when they're dealing with the alien the alien calvin bud and doyle are calvin and the scientists are idiots who engage in it and ruin everything boom huh there you go boom roasted <laughs> i don't even know how i did that i forgot i even saw that movie except for the reference to spider-man that's crazy if you could recast any horror film and put Polly Shore in it, which movie would you do? You only get to choose one. <laughs> and I want hilarity to ensue. So I will start. Okay. Silence of the Lambs. I would oh, replace no. Hannibal Lecter with Polly Shore. Okay. Okay. That's very good. That's very good. And I like that. If I can, I like I'll also take it one step further. Replace Jodie Foster with Kylie Minogue and replace Buffalo Bill with the guy who played would, Faulkner in this movie. I was going to say Buffalo Bill would be uh, Stephen Baldwin. <laughs> oh, oh, I would think that, but William Atherton is just so creepy in a lot of ways that I think he'd be perfect. That's true. That's true. So I, I was thinking I would do the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre oh. <laughs> with, with, Polly Sh- with Polly Shore as, you know, as Leatherface. Is he going to be Franklin? But yeah. Yeah, he'd be Leatherface. I love that. I mean, you know, you can't imagine him being able to like swing around a chainsaw because I can't imagine him lifting one over his head, let alone. I mean, unless you had like one of those like little baby pruners. (laughs) Yeah, right. Like the one that like you like prune the hedges and shit. Like that's how he killed people. (laughs) I could totally see that'd be fucking great. (laughs) And then Stephen Baldwin. I mean, he's just not relevant. So I wouldn't really cast him in anything. I don't know. I feel like any maybe I can see like Stephen Baldwin as um who is the guy that damn it, what's his name? Nicholas Cage in Face Off. I can imagine him playing Nicholas Cage's character in Face Off. I could totally see that for sure. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I mean it's not exactly a horror, but And let's add this. If you were to put, let's say, Jason Voorhees in the biodome, oh, who God. do you think lasts the longest? Dude, the girls. Absolutely, the girls. I think they just fucking run house, man. I feel like they almost were portrayed as like the the ditzy girls, right? Because it's like so easy to do. They're yeah, like the really attractive. It feels really, really aggressive, doesn't it? Yeah, they're, they're the really attractive girls that are scientists, quote unquote, and they end up actually being like super smart and resourceful. And I feel like they're the ones that survive. I like that. I think Romulus would die, but I would really like to see Romulus dance kind of like your Crispin Glover. And then, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I think, did you get like a very much like a ginger Marianne vibe from, Oh, hundred percent from them. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I think that the coconuts to a certain degree, I think is also kind of a reference to Gilligan's Island in as many ways. We look at like the group dynamic. It kind of fits pretty well. Yeah. The professor, right. As the main dude. And then, uh, I don't really know who, who is the old guy in Gilligan's Island. What's his name? The millionaire? Can, yeah, the millionaire. And I forget wife. his name. Right? I'm so, I was like, who's the millionaire? Romulus, maybe? Romulus would be a millionaire and the wife would be um, the scientist that they run across in the very beginning where they try and run through the door. I forget her name. 385 days? It's Olivia. Oh, Olivia. Okay. Yeah. And so then would Doyle, Doyle would be Gilligan and Bud would be who? The skipper? Well, right? that's a tough one. I feel like Bud and Doyle are the Gilligan. It's like a tandem because like, they have kind of a hive mind. And then I feel like the way that he gets so frustrated, Faulkner has to be the captain. He has to be he, he, either that or a professor. But I feel like the professor should go to Romulus because he's smart. Well, that's that's actually a really, uh, really good point. So I don't know. That's kind of cool. It's a little dynamic there, right? It's essentially Gilligan's Island meets meets a uh, bubble boy. <laughs> so last question on this film who do you think has the 
best looking genitals. Not necessarily the biggest, but the best looking <laughs> genitals of everybody in the Biodome 5 plus Bud and Doyle. Hmm. There is I'm gonna a have right to go answer. With... <laughs> I'm going to have to go with Kylie Minogue. That is fair. I was really hoping that you would say something perverse about one of the other guys, but yeah, I think Romulus would have a nicely <laughs> trimmed and manicured. Do you, do you think any of these guys yeah, have an I feel like I don't know. I feel like Romulus could have like a like a super behind the scenes, like down to my knee kind of dick. Yeah, so. dude. <laughs> Although he's like super skinny, so it'd be like a fucking it'd be like a needle dick. But you know, you'd be like, I'm gonna shove it up your butt, or fly. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. All right, buddies. Well, stay tuned next week. We're going to keep doing this at least until quarantine procedures are over. Uh, it's just a dark world. And I know a lot of people are sad. And I know that I mean, our numbers could not be fucking lower right now with everybody having free time and not commuting. Nobody gives a fuck about podcasts because it's like, why would I listen to you talk about Biodome? I'm just going to watch Biodome while I'm quote unquote working from home. <laughs> yeah. And here's the thing also. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love doing this, the podcast with you every week, but at the same time, I'm, this is another safe way for me to just kind of hang out with you. Exactly. You know, so <laughs> there's also that. And if you are into super horror stuff, we obviously are going to be doing the Patreon bonus, which is going to be straight out and out horror. If you're a $5 patron or above, you get a weekly bonus episode, which is awesome. We're always receptive to your recommendations. I have a feeling that May is going to be pretty gory by comparison, just because I feel like we owe it to you to kind of do some gruesomeness. And hopefully by then the world is a much brighter and sunshinier place. We're always open to suggestion. We have the slasher submission form. But feel free to reach out. We'll be happy to engage you. If there's ever anything we can do to try and get you to do a review or you know share about the show, we'd really appreciate it. Because at this point, we've kind of stagnated. And in fact, like I said, our numbers have kind of gone down because of the crisis. So you know, uh, it, new sets of eyes, new sets of ears would be great. Brian, do you have anything to send these goons off with this week? If you ain't watching them dying, you ain't really trying. Bum bum bum. For Brian, I'm Jake. Reminding you to go out there and do something you love. And remember that all work and no power play makes Jack a dull boy.